Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit wpsu.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at wpsu.org slash shop. I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room issues. Was you don't ever say to her that I'm one of the shower points. She's qualified for services. We left. We're trying to back over. currently doing in autism. Best-selling author Lisa Genova calls herself a Harvard-trained neuroscientist, a Meisner-trained actress, and an entirely untrained writer. Her debut novel, Still Alice, describes one woman's journey through early-onset Alzheimer's disease. The New York Times hailed the book as insightful, inspirational, and heartbreakingly real. Her latest novel, Left Neglected, deals with a woman recovering from severe brain trauma. Genova graduated valedictorian from Bates College with a degree in biopsychology and has a Ph.D. in neuroscience from Harvard University. We'll talk with her about how her background in neuroscience helped shape her narratives, her personal experiences with Alzheimer's, and her upcoming novel, Love, Anthony. Here's our conversation with Lisa Genova. Lisa Genova, welcome to the conversation. Hi, thanks for having me. You refer to yourself as a Harvard-trained neuroscientist, a Meisner-trained actress, and an entirely untrained writer, and yet that didn't stop you from, from publishing two bestsellers. Right. Well, so it's a little tongue-in-cheek, but right. I took one English class my freshman year in college, and I had no conscious ambition to become a writer, certainly not a novelist. I was a neuroscientist primarily. Um, the actor thing came, training as an actress came while I was writing the novel because I figured while I'm being a novelist, I might as well just keep going. Um, but you so, said that turned out to be the best writing class you ever could have taken, yeah. the acting. So I stayed away from the writers groups and the writing classes while I was writing Still Alice because I was, I didn't know what I didn't know. I was reading a lot on craft. I was reading great books like On Writing by Stephen King and Writing Down the Bones by Natalie Goldberg, really good books that helped me learn how to write. And I was paying attention as I was reading others other stories as well. Um, but I was afraid of, of being among people who would sort of maybe well-intentioned bully me into writing their version of my story because I just didn't know what I was doing really. Um, but the acting, it turns out all of the things, that, the principles I was learning in acting applied beautifully to writing. Um, things like you're always telling the truth under imaginary circumstances. Um, this moment-to-moment -moment spontaneity. Yeah, exactly. The emotional spontaneity that's really hard for us socialized grown-ups to express. You learn how to do that as an actor. And then I would go home and write and I would find I could be emotionally honest on the page. Age. And that's probably what readers have most often said about Still Alice, is that it is emotionally real, heartbreakingly real. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, that was the goal. My grandmother had Alzheimer's, and I read everything I could find about Alzheimer's to try to help educate my, primarily my, aunt, my aunts who were taking care of her. And everything I read was written from the point of view of the outside looking in, everything was written by a caregiver or a clinician or a scientist. And so this sort of, what does it feel like to have it was missing. And so that's really what I wanted to try to portray was what does it feel like to have it from the perspective of, perspective of the person who has it. And of course the person in Still Alice who has it is Alice Holland who is 50 years old. She's got yeah. the life by the horns. Yeah. She's a, a, a psychology and linguistics professor at Harvard with three children, a successful husband, and things start to slip. She goes for a run on a route that she's, uh, she's taken many, many times and suddenly finds herself in Harvard Square not knowing exactly where she is. Right, and so it, originally the symptoms, you know, there's kind of a fine line between normal forgetting and forgetting that isn't normal. You know, we all walk into the room and say, oh my God, why did I come in here? Or where did I put my keys? Um, but it can, it can start to shift. The, the forgetting can become more frequent and it can become different. So like with forgetting the keys, I tell people, you know, if you can't find your keys and you find them on the hall table, or you find them in your coat pocket, you're fine. If you find them in the refrigerator, or if you find them and think, what are these for? Um, that's the shift that can happen. So with Alice, the forgetting seemed normal at first, like forgetting her Blackberry and 
not remembering our to-do list or but the getting lost in the neighborhood close from close to home that was oh my god something's going on and maybe it's not just I'm too busy or maybe it's not just maybe I'm not getting enough sleep maybe it's not a symptom of menopause and in fact it was Alzheimer's now your grandmother <clears throat> uh, was 85 when when she uh, was diagnosed with with Alzheimer's. Why did you choose to focus on early onset Alzheimer's, the less common? There are 5.4 million Americans with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and just a half a million or so with early onset. Right, so a couple of reasons. So my grandmother, who had Alzheimer's in her 80s, we missed the beginning stages of her Alzheimer's altogether because I think, like a lot of families, we assumed that my grandmother's forgetting was a normal part of normal aging. And she, too, expected to become more and more forgetful as she aged. So she didn't bring what was going on to our attention either. So by the time we as a family really understood what we were dealing with, we missed all of those early stages, those first moments, what the beginning of Alzheimer's looks like. So I thought, well, you know, there are this, these 10% of people with Alzheimer's who are much younger who would very much be sensitive to those beginning stages and not think, well, this is a normal part of being 50. Um, and I also wanted to give a face and a voice to those people who aren't included in what typically gets talked about when people talk about Alzheimer's. I think, you know, the general public, we tend to skip to, if you imagine what it looks like, what is Alzheimer's, you tend to skip to end stage, someone who's quite elderly, someone who's dying from Alzheimer's. Well, what does living with Alzheimer's look like? I sort of I wanted to give a face and a voice to that group of people who aren't included. And I'm kind of wondering where that all came from because you, just, you said you you trained as a neuroscientist at Harvard. You're married. You have one child. It's 2003. You you divorce. Yes. And suddenly this person who's been working as as a strategy consultant in the healthcare industry says, you know what? I'm not going back to that. I'm going to do something completely different. I've taken one writing class, as you said, and I want to be a writer. I mean, I, I kind of think, where does that come from? Yeah. Oh, well, I hadn't even taken a writing class. I had taken an English in class. I mean, like, back when I was 18. Right. Um, it was, you know, I actually, part of it was the divorce. It was um, so life-changing for me, so unexpected, so heartbreaking. Um, and it really did sort of shake everything up. And I started asking myself some questions like, okay, you know, what do I want my life to look like now? And I had planned to go back to that job as a strategy consultant. I was a divorced single mom. Like, that was the responsible thing to do, and I was good at it and paid well, and that's where I should have gone. And that was the plan, but then the questions kept coming, and it was like, well, hold on a second. Why do I have to go back to that, to my job that I had before my daughter was born? If I could do anything I wanted, what would that be? And my answer, which was really exciting and really terrifying, was write the novel. Um, so I did. I dropped my daughter off at preschool, and instead of going to my responsible job, I went to the Starbucks near my house and began writing Still Alice. And so how did you support yourself in that period? Because it was actually 2003 you started this. It took you a year and a half to write it, yeah. and it wasn't self-published until 2007. Yeah. Well, so in the beginning, it was in the divorce. We split up assets, and I had a nest egg, and I knew I could live for a while and comfortably, and it would be okay. I wasn't saving any money, but it would you know, we weren't going to be out on the street. Um, and then a few things happened. I started dating again, and I got remarried, and we moved to Cape Cod. And um, by the time I moved there, I, I, I self-published the book um, shortly after that. Which is an interesting story, too. So you take this book that you've written uh, out of some passion that came from, you know, deep within, and you can't find a publisher. You send a, a hundred letters or more to literary agents, and, and what do they say to you? Yeah, so it's funny. I'm still finding the rejection letters. Um, so I did what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to send out query letters to literary agents, and I got the big Bible of a book, the literary marketplace that lists all of these agents. And I did. I sent out a hundred query letters, and um, I... I'm still waiting to hear back from some of them. <laughs> um, I mostly heard back no in the form of a, a standard form rejection letter, dear author, no thank you. And those are the little slips of paper I'm still finding tucked away in books today in my office where I'll go to clean out a folder and I've got, I found 19 of them a few weeks ago and I thought I'd thrown them all away years ago. Um, so you wait, and it's a, I'm, a, I'm pretty impatient, and so this was a difficult time for me. The book I felt was done. I was waiting to hear from someone who might represent it who could then take it to a publishing house. 
Um, and so about nine months into waiting, I heard back from four agents who wanted to read the manuscript. Um, one I'm still waiting to hear back from. Two said, Alzheimer's, I think it's just there's not an audience out there who's going to be willing to read about Alzheimer's. It's too depressing. Um, and then the last one just couldn't wrap his brain around the fact that I've got this PhD in neuroscience from Harvard. He's like, what are you doing writing a novel? You should be writing nonfiction. Right. Write a nonfiction book about Alzheimer's and then get back to me. But at this point, I had remarried, moved to Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and there are no biotechnology, neuroscience, lab, pharmaceutical, anything on Cape Cod. So I'm like, you had to make I'm this hoping work. to make it work somehow. <laughs> so without really any other choice, um, because I didn't want to self-publish, but I, I, I did. I, in the summer of 2007, I self-published. You self-published. You spent $450. <laughs> you went to yes. a, a company called iUniverse. Yes. And you sold this out of the back of your car. <clears throat> Uh, maybe by the end, by the time it sold at auction to Simon & Schuster, maybe a thousand copies. How many copies have sold since then? Um, I don't exactly know. Um, I know that there are over a million copies in print in the U.S. and over a million copies have sold wor worldwide. Um, it's been translated into, I think, 27 languages now. A and what it really says is people weren't looking for nonfiction. Right. They, I, they're really learning about Alzheimer's through yeah. fiction. Well, so, you know, Alzheimer's is this, you know, people are afraid of it. It's, it reminds me of what cancer was like 40, 50 years ago where we couldn't even say the word. People called it the big C. People are afraid to talk about Alzheimer's, but it's affecting, you just said, 5.4 million Americans have it. And those 5.4 million people have people who love them. So this is affecting a lot of people, and everybody's afraid to talk about it. But we need to understand it, and we want to understand it. And we want to stay connected to our loved ones as much as we can as they're slipping away. And how do we do that? Well, reading nonfiction is homework. It's hard work. It's, it's dry, and it's facts and mm -hmm. bullet points. But if I can read a story and learn through that, um, you know, stories are what sort of move us and entertain us. And in the, in the meanwhile, while we're reading a story that entertains, hopefully we're maybe learning a little something about this disease that's so scary. In fact, you approached this book as a scientist. You <laughs> talked with uh, physicians who are working with patients with early onset Alzheimer's at Massachusetts Hospital and, and different uh, experts around the country. Um, how long were you compiling information before you said, okay, I'm ready to sit down and write? Yeah, I do. I have a similar process, it turns out, for each of my books. I, I front load with about four months of research, which begins with reading everything I can and then reaching out and talking to people. And it's great. It turns out this PhD in neuroscience from Harvard, which I thought I was sort of putting on a shelf and felt sort of bad about, it gives me the credentials and the credibility that I need to walk through all the doors I knock on. So I can call the chief of neurology at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and say, I'd like to know how a 50-year-old might be diagnosed with Alzheimer's. What does that conversation sound like? What does it feel like to sit opposite that neurologist? Like, what happens? And he said, come on in. And we walked through that conversation for two hours. Um, and I sh got to shadow neurologists and sit in on neuropsych testing. Um, so I, I do that for about four months, and then I begin writing, and then I fill in as I go. So in the story with Still Alice, there's um, a scene with a genetic counselor. And I didn't do that up front. I realized I needed to talk to a genetic counselor when that part of the story came into play. And I found one, and I, I met with her a couple of times. And Alice started a support group for people suffering from yeah. early onset Alzheimer's. And as it turns out, there actually is one, an international support network, yeah. so that people can talk about what's happening th to them uh, in their 50s. Yeah, so interestingly, when I was writing the book back, this was around 2004, um, it was very spotty in terms of there being support groups for people with dementia. Primarily, all of the, the, in, the national network of support groups was for the caregivers. And the, there was this omission of leaving the, the people suffering from Alzheimer's out of that because there was this idea that, like, well, they don't really need it because they were, again, in their mind, thinking of more advanced stages of the disease. But what about the people living with it? And along with the publication of Still Alice, and I think in part the book has helped facilitate this, we're seeing more and more in every state support groups for people with dementia, people in the earlier stages of Alzheimer's who can still you know, get together and chat about what it feels like to have it.
It's interesting how you told the story because it was, it started in 2003 and month by month for two years, we watched how this disease progressed and how it changed Alice's life. Um, is that accurate? And the reason I ask that is we often think of Alzheimer's as the long goodbye. Yeah, so again, I'm telling the truth under imaginary circumstances and this is probably the place where I deviated a little bit and here's how. So the disease does get worse, worse month by month, not day by day, not year by year. You will see changes on a month by month basis. Um, but it, the disease can progress anywhere from two to 20 years and we physicians have nothing to predict which way it will go for you. They can't say well you have these sets of criteria you're going to progress in two years or 20 years and that's a really difficult things for difficult thing for families to plan for how do you plan emotionally or financially for two years versus it could be 20 years um, so in the interest of not making this a 900 page novel I chose and because it's sort of the stakes are higher I chose two years rather than 20 and in fact one of the patients the neurologist was um, managing while I was um, going in and observing, he, she was 53 and had um, just passed away and she had had it for two years. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is I gave Alice a very straight and narrow shot to diagnosis, so that moved the story along quickly. That's the, probably the biggest place where I deviated from truth. Most people who are under the age of 65 who are diagnosed with Alzheimer's do not find a straight and narrow shot to diagnosis. They spend months and even years thinking, well, maybe it's depression or maybe it's menopause or maybe I'm going crazy and I'm just not going to go to the doctor and I'm going to you know, live in denial um, because it's not really on people's radar and, of course, no one wants it to be Alzheimer's. So it's usually a pretty... Um, convoluted path to diagnosis, especially in the younger folks. Uh, speaking of paths, uh, you write this book. It's, it's something that you needed to do and you did. And, and, uh, but once the book was picked up by a publisher, you were given a contract for two additional books. How different was it to write your second book, which <laughs> was left neglected, knowing that it's already published? Um, mm. um, so you'd and think, you already have a bestseller under your belt. Right. So you'd think like, well, this is the dream, right? Every writer would love to know that their book is going to be published and they're going to get paid for it. Like this is such a blessing, right? And it is. But there's a flip side to that. And that is you've now got a deadline and people are watching and waiting. And so with Still Alice, it was a very, you know, I, don't, I, I used to tell my husband, you know, 20 years from now when I've got however many books published and done, and I do an interview and someone says, what was your favorite book to write? I bet it's going to be Still Alice, um, because no one was watching, right. and it was a very sort of romantic, creative, I was just learning all the time and pouring everything I was learning into this, this book. Um, with Left Neglected, I was terrified, and this turns out to be a pretty common experience I've learned of writers of their second books which follow a big hit. Um, and it was, a, it was an equally big hit really. Yeah, so I was, I was really quite scared while I was writing it, like what if it's terrible, what if I can only write about Alzheimer's, um, what if I can't finish it on time. And I was also pregnant with my third child while I was writing it and I'm not a graceful pregnant woman. Um, so there was all of sort of that going on, being pregnant while trying to write on a deadline. So it was, um, I was in my own way psychologically quite a bit during the book. But that aside, loved learning about left neglect, loved the research phase of that, and then the creative part of writing that story was also a lot of fun. And we should explain that le left neglect is about another young woman. The, the, the uh, protagonist in this book is Sarah. Yeah. She's uh, got a busy, high-powered life. She's a, a Harvard graduate as well, and she's multitasking as she's driving along. She's talking on the telephone. She takes her eyes off the road for a moment too, too long and is in, a, in an accident that leaves her uh, brain damaged. Uh, the, yeah. the right side of her brain is damaged and so she doesn't even recognize that she has a left side. As it turns out, um, I I'm familiar a little bit with that ah. because my mother had a massive stroke oh and suffers from, from mm. left neglect. Okay. Um, yeah, most people aren't familiar with it, so that's interesting. Um, I hope she's doing well. It's um, not 
very well paid attention to by the clinical community because there isn't a pharmaceutical that treats it. So a lot of people aren't aware of left neglect, which is this very bizarre neurological condition um, caused by damage to the right side of your brain in which your brain no longer pays attention to or is aware of anything on the left side of anything, often including the left side of you. So if you have it, your eyes still work, you're not blind, your vision is fine, you actually see everything. And you're not paralyzed, um, you could move your left arm and leg if only you believed that it belonged to you. Um, so it's this strange condition um, that I'd always, that I'd heard about over and over again as a neuroscientist and as a student. Um, but everything I heard about it was limited to a doctor's office or a hospital setting, and it was pencil and paper test, so draw a clock and all the numbers are written on the right hand side of the circle. And I kept thinking, well, what if they have to be somewhere at nine o'clock? Like how does someone who's Function. only right, how does someone who's only aware of the left side of it who's only aware of the right side of everything walk through a whole world, only aware of half of it? So that was sort of the question that began that book. And then it became sort of this interesting metaphor. So here's this bizarre, extreme form of inattention where the left side of everything drops away. So you and I would only have makeup on the right side of our face today and we'd think we're fully done up and looking great. Um, so how, how does someone, like there's this extreme inattention and then we think that's so strange. Well, what about all the ways that we don't pay attention to things and ignore things and look the other way on things every day and call it normal. Um, so that was sort of the idea behind Sarah's, the, you know, working mothers today especially. We're, we're doing five things at once instead of one thing at once, and we're proud of this. We're, we're multitaskers. We can do it all. We're busy, busy, busy. Um, we're all, people are on the phones while they're driving the car, not paying attention to the road. Our full attention is never is not, on one thing. Yeah, we're, it's spread really so thin. And I wonder how your work, and because that is the underlying message, really stop and smell the roses, live moment to moment. Um, and really, in both of those books, the character has a greater appreciation for life, even though they've lost so much. I'm wondering how you prioritize your own life, because as you said, you have this busy life as an author now. Yeah. You've got three children, a husband who's, a, who's a, an author himself. He yeah. does, he's a photographer and, and, and has captured uh, uh, New England in, in photographs in yes. a number of books. How do you make it all work, and how do you prioritize it? Yeah, well, it's a co it takes a constant vigilance and, you know, because there are a lot of demands on me and it's, I think, you know, I'm, I'm like most working women and working mothers in particular. Um, it's hard. Uh, I, I tend to try to keep a balance where I have 20 hours a week to write and do work and um, the rest belongs to the family and the kids, but then there are there are the situations where I'm asked to travel and then whoosh, that all goes up in the air and I lean a lot on my husband and um, my parents and his parents and, and friends who will help out with the childcare. But primarily when I'm not traveling, my week is that I, I write in the mornings and I'm available to all three kids afternoon and evenings. Um, so I try to go to yoga once a day. Um, we live on Cape Cod so there's you know the chance to go take a walk on the beach pretty much you know, anytime we want. So it's, it sounds like it could be a crazy lifestyle, but when I'm not traveling, it actually is pretty balanced. And, and I then, never use my cell phone in the car. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Learned that lesson from yeah, Sarah. Yes, I did. Tell us about your book that's coming out in 2013. Okay, so I'm writing Love, Anthony now, and this is about um, a boy with severe autism. So he's on the end of the spectrum where he's nonverbal and doesn't like to make eye contact and doesn't like to be touched. And it's about his mother and another woman who will become um, connected to them in an important way. But the book is about, I tell some of it through his point of view, so it's about giving a voice to this voiceless child. And it's about how do we love and how do we feel love and express love if the ways that we normally do that are unavailable to you. So if we can't say the words, I love you, and if we can't hug, and if we can't exchange all that magic that happens between eye contact, then how do you, how do you express it and feel it? So that's really what the book is about. Now, Love, Anthony, you've pretty much, my guess is you have that book under wraps. It will come out in two, I mean, there's still some work to be done, but my guess is you already are thinking of book number four. Book number four is going to be about a woman who, um, 
she's in her late 20s and it, most of the book will take place in present day and she's in her genetic counselor's office and they're talking about the pros and cons of whether or not she should get tested to see if she has the gene for Huntington's disease. Um, her mother has it and she it's Huntington's disease is purely genetic so if your parent has it you have a 50 percent chance of having the gene that will cause the disease. Um, you don't become symptomatic for Huntington's until you're in your 30s, usually after you've already had children and unwittingly passed it down. So most of the book is this conversation between her and a counselor about what it would mean. She's in a relationship. Should she get married? Should she have kids? Um, what will it do to her relationship with her sister, who doesn't want to know anything at all and is in denial about all of it? Um, it's about her caring for her mother who's got this. But interspersed in between each of those chapters is going to be a chapter about one of her ancestors um, who had Huntington's. Mm -hmm. And so one of them will be a great-great-grandmother who was tried and hung as a witch in Salem oh. because they thought she was possessed by demons, but she had Huntington's. But she had already, and she leaves behind mm -hmm. three orphans. Um, and, and so it goes. And so you'll sort of see this sort of family tree and the, and the gene chasing her through history. And you've really found a niche, kind of following in the footsteps of Oliver Sacks. Ah, thank you. Yeah, he's uh, the man who mistook his wife for a hat by Oliver Sacks is the, the book that really ignited my passion for neuroscience to begin with. So thank you for that. that All right, and thank lot. you so much for talking with us. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Lisa Genova. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find excerpts of Still Alice and Left Neglected. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. If you've enjoyed Conversations from Penn State and would like to purchase a DVD of this show or any of our other episodes, you can place an order online by visiting us at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 1-800-770-2111. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.